New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. We've all heard the name of the Roman general Mark Antony. But who was he before he became a legend? Before he rose as a man in full, distinguishing himself in battle and also being forever linked at the lip with Cleopatra. We'll meet a boy struggling to redeem his disgraced family name in this week's novel, Antonius, Son of Rome. It's book one in novelist Brooke Allen's Antonius Trilogy. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. A special tip of the hat to everybody watching via our YouTube channel. Of course, there's not a lot of video this week, but we promise you a very interesting discussion. Nonetheless, our guest this week, Brooke Allen, has traveled extensively, so we're going to get some of those pictures in here, and that'll really help us to travel back to the period of her novel. This is the kind of story that I love. It's doing what fiction does best and making us want to look at the real history along the way. Brooke Allen has a real passion for this time period, and she's going to share it with us. She studied ancient Rome in school. She earned a BA from Asbury University and a master's at Holland University. She had an emphasis in ancient Roman studies, and that's so important in a fiction writer to have that anchor in the facts that helps you bring the real story to life when you're writing historical fiction. You can visit her at brookeallenauthor.com or find her on Twitter and Facebook. Okay, now that we've returned to the days of bread and circuses, let's join Brooke Allen and meet Antonius, son of Rome. Here we are with Brooke Allen. She's the author of Antonius, Son of Rome, which is book one of her Antonius trilogy. Welcome to the History Author Show, Brooke. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Dean. Pleased to be here. Well, I'm so pleased to have you. I enjoyed your books so much. I was really happy that another author that I've had on the show, Tanya Mitchell, connected me with you and I was able to enjoy your passion and This is what you want if you're watching on YouTube. You want a guest that's smiling, an author that has passion, that my days working in TV, I could tell you there's nothing worse than somebody coming on and looking like they don't want to be there. You just told me before I began recording that you have a little news to break here about Son of Rome. So why don't you go ahead and share that with listeners? Yeah, just last night I learned that I am now a semi-finalist in the Chanticleer International Book Awards uh, for the Chaucer Award, which is a division specifically for books from 1650 all the way back to prehistory uh, for historical fiction. So I'm honored and, and very humbled to be a part of that. So, Well, you've earned it with your hard work, certainly here, <laughs> writing Son of Rome. It's just a book from that long ago. I'll just speak for myself, but I'm sure a lot of listeners feel the same way. It could be intimidating to read about 2100, 2000, even even 100 years ago. You don't know the players, you're you're intimidated by the language maybe, or those Roman names that you're never (laughs) quite sure. How would I pronounce that? If I tried to tell somebody how much I enjoyed this book, I'm not sure how to say it. Did you have (laughs) readers like myself in mind when you wrote this book so that everybody could dive right in and no matter what we knew about Rome, all roads would lead us to son of Rome? Well, I tell you, there's only about 10 pronomen, which are the first names of Romans, like Lucius, Marcus, Sextus, whatever. And so, yeah, it's, it's a challenge when you're writing about a period <clears throat> where you're, you're worried about pronunciation, you're worried about grabbing the reader's interest and keeping them drawn in. Uh, and when you have so many of these types of names, oh goodness, you know, it's, it's hard to keep them all sorted and to keep it basic. And Boy, the the hard work that my editor and I put in towards just the beginning of the book in some of the crowd scenes, uh, banquet scenes, where we had multiple characters in the conversation, it was it was a huge challenge and it was problematic, but we solved it. You know, we just tried to be very direct about always calling so and so so and so, always calling Marcus Marcus, always calling mother mother, for example it just made things more flowing and more consistent. And that's what you have to do. You have to, as an author, 
really, really try to itemize things <laughs> and keep them as basic as possible, because then it's a pleasure to read. It's not work. Yeah, you absolutely don't want to have to be reading one of those books that are like ones I have behind me, some of them, which is enjoyable. And I always like extra information packed into a book, but you don't want to have to refer back to that first page and say, wait a minute, who was that? Who was you know, all these people? I don't remember that guy, especially when you're dealing with the trilogy, right? Yeah. And I was really concerned. I, I even thought about putting a dramatis personae in, in, in the book, but I decided not to just to try to simplify things again. And, um, you know, I haven't had many readers complain. So I'm really thankful for that because that tells me that I've done my job. I have kept, you know, as many, as few names as possible and kept them in order so that people know who's who. And that's, uh, it's, it's problematic, especially with these types of names. But, you know, if you can really manage it, um, it works well not to have, you know, the book over bulked with chronologies and um, dramatis personae, list of characters and, and terms and things like that. So you did all that hard work with your editor so that we didn't have to as readers. And I just, I think that's great. We get to reap all the benefits and we don't have to worry about which version of this centurion that we're talking about that both had the same name. So I, I feel your pain, but also I'm <laughs> glad you went through that pain. All I am too, because you know, it, it's growing pain. You learn from the lessons and after a while, especially with the following books, it was a lot more manageable and a lot easier to, to take care of. So it paid off in the long run, I guess. <laughs> you live and learn. You mentioned your editor, who is also your graphic designer. And I didn't want to go too long without mentioning these gorgeous covers. And they really are that. They're so striking. I get a ton of books that come across my desk. And for these to stand out from ones that are from a major publishing house is really an accomplishment. Some of those all look the same. You'll get a bunch of common colors, common themes that are in covers, and you really can't tell one book from the other. Whereas all of these, each one, and people watching via YouTube can see them behind me, each one stands out from the next. And a lot of books just can't hold a candle to them, frankly. I was really blown away by the quality of what these look like. And I immediately thought of what it would look like, what Son of Rome would look like on my webpage, or what it would look like when I tweet that out or in the video. It's really going to be eye-catching for people. <laughs> So tell us about that collaboration, because that's a key part of bringing this Antonius trilogy to life is people are going to judge a book by its cover. They are. And boy, that is so real. I don't know who created that adage that don't judge a book by its cover. They're crazy because you do. <laughs> and it's part of the industry. I mean, you know, it, people are going to look at covers first. Jenny Quinlan, Jenny Q is what she's called at HNS, Historical Novel Society. She is a phenomenally talented marketing professional, as well as an editor and cover designer. And she is my collaboration specialist. I, I don't know what I do without her because it's one-stop shopping. She does my developmental edits. She uh, does my covers and also my copy edits for me. And um, I just, I can't say enough good about her. It's really fun because when we first approach a cover, Dean, it's, it's more like, hey, what is your vision here for this book? What do you, what statement do you want to make on the cover about this novel? And for Son of Rome, we were approaching Mark Antony's early life and also how he struggled so hard to finally become an officer in the Roman legions and get his first commission. And so I wanted it to be evocative of where he got that commission, which was the East. And so actually the desert, the dunes behind the figure in the picture is actually my photograph that I took in Egypt. How great is that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, but when it came out, it was in the summer in Egypt. And so it was about 117 degrees when I took the picture. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. You could just about see, you know, waves of heat on the sand. And the, the background was extremely washed out. It was kind of this light peachy color. And I couldn't stand it. I was like, oh, you know, that's what was showing up on her mock-ups. And I said, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but Jenny, could you just make it a night sky and see what it would look like. And she said, oh, I don't think that would be good at all. I said, well, let's just humor me. And can you, can you just try it? And she did. 
And we both loved it. We both loved it. And it's kind of become an iconic cover of all three books in the series, to be honest. Uh, it's my husband's favorite. You know, it's probably my favorite, although I like the third one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, something to like about all of them. And I think that's really important. As you said, we do judge books by their covers. And yes. I realize people said that way back in the old days when books all had those same green people watching via YouTube again can see behind me probably some of those is a tale of two cities up there that's just this drab olive green and that's it. So I guess it would have been harder then, but <laughs> we certainly all do judge them by their covers and these are just stunning. And you lead me right into there speaking about going through the phases of his life that we first meet this man, Mark Anthony, at just 11 years old and mm -hmm. his father has died in disgrace. So I wanted to ask you, what those circumstances meant for a young man at that point in his life, because it's one thing to want to be a soldier, but having what it takes is a very different thing. And young people are usually so conflicted. So what did that mean for him? When we first meet him in Son of Rome, book one of three, what is his station in life? What are his prospects? Yeah, they weren't too good at that point <laughs> uh, because his family had been humiliated. Uh, in Roman culture, Dean, there are two words that are synonymous with success in, in Roman male superiority, and that is dignitas, which is dignity, but in a, I should say, in a more um, life-consuming sense. Dignity was everything to them. And if they were insulted, if they were humiliated very badly, you know, they just couldn't handle that real well. And they would fall to pieces that suicide was a common occurrence, especially in the period when Mark Antony lived. The other word is imperium. You wanted power and imperium was not only power in the Senate, it was power on the battlefield. And, you know, as an 11 year old child with his family disgraced due to his father's, um, I, I guess he had good intentions but he screwed up and the Senate, you know, would have denounced him had he made it back, but he died. We don't know exactly how. It could have been suicide because of, of shame involved. I think that Antony was consumed also with the, t the sign of the times. The Republic of Rome, which had been in place since about the fifth or sixth century BC was falling apart. Uh, Rome was just getting so huge. You know, you had a lot of great commanders already, even before Caesar, such as Sulla, such as Marius, who had added so much to area in, in the Roman world that all of a sudden, you know, these many places were needing governors, proconsuls. These many places were needing armies to keep everything together. And it was becoming just really difficult. And that was just in the international scene. You know, in Rome, there was now more of a struggle for one man rule than senatorial rule. And it, it, it really was a time when anybody who was his age at 11, for example, they were not seeing their government ever running correctly. It was never running properly. And so by the time he reached uh, puberty and into his teens, it was a real hot mess. In fact, his, his own stepfather was involved in a huge coup and was caught. And I won't tell what happens because that would ruin part of my plot, but um, it was another terrible tragedy. And you know, so the way he was raised and the way he turned out, you know, he started drinking, he started partying, he started trying to escape the, the difficulties of life and realities of a dying government of, you know, the world crumbling around him, I think. Just couldn't quite get his hands around what he needed to be doing. And it's not until towards like maybe three quarters the way through the book when he finally does get his first commission as a military officer and his life starts turning around some. Was that what drew you to him? I would think it was something in his early life that you decided, hey, let me tell 
his life, not in just one book, but in three novels and really get into it. What was it that first drew you to him and that you hope will also draw in readers? Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is I wasn't really drawn to Antony per se. You know, he was certainly an interesting character, somebody that I enjoyed reading about. I'd read Margaret George's memoirs of Cleopatra early on, but It was funny when I was a sophomore in high school, I was in my English class and we read Julius Caesar and I did love history. And I was so drawn to this story for some crazy reason. There were so many fascinating characters. There was Caesar, Cleopatra, you know, Cleopatra's not in the story, Shakespeare, but, you know, she was around. Um, There was Antony, there was Brutus, there was Cicero. There, There are just so many phenomenal personalities alive all at once at the end of the first century BC. And um, when I finally got to the point where I was ready to start writing on one of them, um, you know, Caesar had been done. Cleopatra had been almost overdone. um, Robert Harris had just finished his phenomenal trilogy on Marcus Tullius Cicero. And I kept coming back to Antony because you know, he did have the military career. It wasn't always good, but it was there. He was extremely brave, but he also had so many flaws. And for an author creating, you know, a historical fiction novel, that was a dream. You know, there was the romance romance involved. Um, there are two major romances in, in my trilogy concerning his life. So, you know, it was just a really win-win situation using him. And after a while, he and I became quite close and good friends and my husband approved and, you know, we, we just went forward and I, it's turned out to be more or less a saga instead of just a trilogy. I mean, it's, it's a huge story and it's been fun to learn how to manage it and fun to see it just come together, you know three separate books and hopefully they could stand alone. But at the same time, to me, it's more fulfilling if you're reading a trilogy to start at the beginning, start with son of Rome. Well, he had such a sweeping life, didn't he? And that's the thing. When you look at somebody who wrote three books, there's always that wonder in the back of my mind anyway, being somebody that's kind of in the book business where you think, well, did the person just not want to edit? But we know now that you have a good editor. So this is not just that you couldn't stop yourself from writing. You really had good, important things to say. And you had the story and your reader first, which I also really appreciate. And it comes through in your writing. I wanted to ask you something else here about the whole idea of this distance that you have from this time. It is so long ago. And I listened to another interview that you did about your trilogy And you said something that jumped out at me because it reminded me of Ulysses S. Grant, who's behind me. And I did a few interviews recently. I did an interview with Louis Pacon recently on Grant's tomb and one on Vicksburg, a bunch of things as presidency, because he had the same thing. He had a lot of people who hated him. And the line about Grant is that his enemies were better writers than his friends. And it is only very recently that we are beginning to get the full story. We have a treasure trove, new papers released, things like that, where we can give him a fair picture. And I have a Wheaton bottle around here somewhere. If people saw that interview with Louis Pacon, and it calls him Caesar of the Hudson, which gives you an idea of how people <laughs> looked at Ulysses S. Grant and having saved the union. So when I picture this man, Mark Antony, having been written about by his enemies, then I think of you, you pick up your <laughs> pen and paper, not your sword and shield, but you <laughs> fight through this phalanx of biased history to take up for the guy and to defend him. So why does that happen? And what made you say, hey, I'm the person who can dig through all that bad history and find the little nuggets that are true, that ring true to you. And your education would certainly help you do that and say, well, this is just 2000 years back or around the year zero. This was fake news, the equivalent of that somebody who just hated him. Because if I read an account of this man, I don't know that this person hated him, but you would know that. So you would know, don't trust that source. So how did you do that? What was that process? Because that must have been daunting to know you were going to have to dig through all of that BS to bring us the true story here in Son of Rome. Either that or you make up BS (laughs) so that you don't fall short. (laughs) But you're exactly right. Um, Back in Roman times, uh, what you're describing was called damnatio memoriae. And it was the damning of one's memory. And it was a very real uh, method 
that emperors used and even preceding that, even in Egyptian history that, you know, monarchs would use to erase or alter history to suit them best. And um, of course, that's what Augustus, Octavian Augustus did with Antony after his death. Um, he tried to alter history. He took full responsibility for the destruction and defeat of Brutus and Cassius, where actually that was Antony's victory, very much so. Um, that's just one example. But why did I take up a sword and shield <laughs> on his behalf? You know, I guess you always love an underdog. I, I've always kind of had a heart for people who struggle their whole life. And I think Antony did struggle his whole life. In some ways, he was very much shafted. My husband certainly thinks so. He thinks he got a raw deal. You know, Caesar didn't really include him extensively in his will in any way, shape or form. Um, maybe he had his reasons for that. And that's true. But it could be argued that Antony certainly did have a lot more experience in both governing and in warfare than Octavian did, had. And quite often Octavian was not on the up and up and really treating him well. Um, there are several times in, you know, in my own story and in history when Octavian set up meeting times with Antony and Antony would sail all the way from Greece to meet Octavian or from Egypt or wherever he was. And Octavian wasn't even there to meet him, you know? Just, just pulling his strings and, and, and making him mad on purpose. So, you know, there was no great love between these two um, gentlemen. And I, I think that seeing what all Antony went through, yes, he probably did have a romantic feeling towards Cleopatra. It wasn't just sex. You know, I think that there was a huge commitment between them and that obviously that would have had, you know, included love. Um, emotion involved. A lot of people think, think otherwise. But for me to see the end and how they stuck together, they never did betray one another to Octavian. And they both had the opportunity to do so. But they didn't. So I, I believe that Antony down deep was a fairly good guy. You know, I, I think that he struggled with binge drinking. I think he struggled with low self-esteem. And he was also possibly, especially toward the end, manic depressive without any kind of you know, drug to help him through it. And um, you know, with, with all of those things in mind, he became just this amazing character that I just wanted to bring out. Because you know what? We've heard Cleopatra's point of view. We've heard Caesar's point of view. We've heard Cicero's point of view. We've heard Brutus's point of view now. We've never heard his, you know, he's been silent for 2000 years and um, it was time to tell the end of the Republic from his point of view, I think. Did you ever so, consider doing it in nonfiction? I did, but that's no fun. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's all fact. And, you know, I, I am a rather passionate person and I wanted to tell it from a historical fiction point of view because that way, to me, there's there's just that warmth of emotion and there's that human sentiment there that had to have been present um, between him and Cleopatra, between his he and his children. Holy mo, he had three children by Cleopatra. Um, most people don't realize that. Most people don't realize that he was pretty much coerced into his last Roman marriage with Octavia, Octavian's sister. They were both coerced. It wasn't just on, you know, Antony's side. Um, Octavia had just been widowed and um, she was still pregnant with her former husband's child when her brother arranged the marriage between herself and Antony. So, wow. Yeah. And all of the things that we think of when we hear their names, it's tough because you're most people probably, I'll just speak for myself, picture Elizabeth Taylor. And that's when you realize <laughs> that you're, you don't have the, you don't have the real story when you've gotten it just from in passing, seeing the trailer for the movie or seeing the movie or something like that, where they take such huge license and Hollywood could, could have cared. HBO's, yeah. HBO's Rome took the most license that I, oh, 
it killed me. You know, I guess I'm more of a purist. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. And um, it, yeah, and I was in the middle of writing Son of Rome, actually, when that came out. And it, it just really wrenched my heart to see what they did with Antony's character, with Atia's character, because it was nothing like the way it was historically. Uh, the costumes were beautiful. You know, the sets were nice and very realistic to what they would have been, I think, back in, you know, the late Republic. But the storyline and, and the, the liberties they took in the historical record were vast. <laughs> vast like, like the Grand Canyon vast, okay? <laughs> you said something there about the binge drinking too and about struggling as a soldier. Exact same reason that I'm so drawn to Ulysses S. Grant and so many people are. Where he was a little guy, has the, the problem with the binge drinking, really. He's not really a, this guy who's drunk all the time drinks every single morning to get through the day but and also struggles being a soldier all of those things very interesting to see those parallels throughout history yeah. i usually like to ask a novelist to read a passage from his or her work so that'll tell us a little bit about what you think is important what you find really significant in the book and it'll give people that are listening and watching a flavor for what you've written so go ahead pick set this up for us and tell us what you like here out of Son of Rome that you hope will catch our attention. All right. Well, because he did have such a huge uh, interest in the military, of course, Antony's first commission would have been extremely important to him. Uh, at the time of this passage that I'm about to read, Aulus Gabinius has just been um, commandeered by the Senate to be the proconsul provinciae of Syria. And so this is in the 50s BC. Antony is in Athens studying, um, trying to make something of himself because he has really made a mess of himself previously. So anyway, he is trying to get his first commission and meets with Aulus Gabinius. And unfortunately, it doesn't go all that well. So he's riding back to Athens. And this is what happens. Cool evening breezes from the sea stirred Marcus's hair. His horse plodded up the road leading back to Athens. Disheartened at how things had turned, he let the animal pick its own slow pace. If only Gabinius had offered him a commission and given him a chance, another opportunity was gone. Depression's suffocating darkness crashed back in full force. Suddenly, Fadia's death felt keen and new. Every failure from his father's poor judgment on to Lentulus's treason and finally extending to Uncle Hybrida's recall seemed magnified and overwhelming. Just ahead, some travelers were sitting around a fire next to the ruins of the long wall. Someone must have told a joke for they were all laughing. As he passed their jollity, Marcus decided to stop at the first tavern he could find. Sadly, the wine wouldn't be as full and heady as Gabinius's. But when his only objective was to get completely drunk, it didn't really matter. Suddenly, his horse lifted its ears and head. Whinnying, the animal blew and flared its nostrils. Marcus halted. Behind him, he heard hoofbeats. Someone was riding hard and fast. Since he wasn't in a hurry, he turned his horse to the side of the road. Whoever it was could gallop on by. Something had to be awfully urgent to push a horse that fast in the dark. When the rider was even with Marcus, he pulled up quickly. I'm looking for Marcus Antonius, he declared. I am he. I'm a courier from Alus Gabinius, proconsul provinciae of Syria. I have a message for you. The courier handed over a small scroll canister. Marcus's heart raced as he popped the lid. He lifted the courier standing in the road and he backtracked a short distance to borrow light from the traveler's fire. They were welcoming and he sidled in, unrolling the message. It read, Aus Gabinius, proconsul provinciae of Syria to Marcus Antonius. I hereby offer you full commission in my legion as cavalry commander of my auxiliary units. My courier awaits your answer. Report directly to me within three days time for orders. Marcus reread the scroll four times, hardly believing his eyes, the blackest of nights morphed into victorious dawn. He had a command. Well, if you think it was enjoyable listening to you read, then you'll certainly 
dear listeners and viewers want to pick up a copy here of Son of Rome, because I'll tell you, when you ask somebody to read something, sometimes it can be really risky. You wonder, <laughs> is it going to be exciting? But the words just sweep and bring us along there. You did a really great job of reading it. And we can all feel for that moment, right? It doesn't matter that it's 2021. People are still mm -hmm. opening letters and hoping to get that break. And that really draws us into his life. And there's that part in all of us that roots for the underdog. Once we get to know him and see his life story and know he gets this raw deal because of the way that his father dies and how much disgrace means, that's just such a great passage, a great moment to meet him at that moment. When does that fall in the book? Actually, that's closer towards the end, about three quarters of the way through, I guess. So we've already struggled with him by that point. Oh, yeah. He's, he's had all <laughs> kinds of lows and highs, you know, happiness too, and romance. He's lived a lot of his life by then, then. <laughs> you know, he, he was still young. He was only about 25, 26 at that point. But I got to say that, yeah, he'd already lived a lot of life. And, you know, I think that's another reason I had to wait and, and tell this story in my 50s, because I had to learn a lot more about life before I, you know, wrote this one, um, because it, it does have a lot of poignant and <clears throat> moments full of angst, I should say. You're enjoying my conversation with Brooke Allen. She's the author of the Antonius Trilogy. The books are... Son of Rome, the one that we're kicking it off with today in our interview, followed by book two, Second in Command. And I like that title because it reminds us that he's still trying. He's still not the top dog in Rome. And it's rounded out in the finale, Soldier of Fate. You can visit our guest at brookeallenauthor.com for more on her incredible time travel adventure back to the Roman period to meet this forgotten Roman, this man who we know his name and we've heard about him from Shakespeare, but we never really meet him until we read a book like this. And I don't know that there's any other book exactly like this, by the way. Tanya Mitchell, who I did interview about her Nellie Bly novel, A Feigned Madness, wrote of Brooke's book, quote, Brooke Allen's writing is so beautifully evocative of the period she writes about, unquote. I can agree with her on that. Tanya went on to provide a question for you, Brooke. She talked about the fact that we know that men and women think very differently. Another thing that hasn't changed in 2000 years, I am sure. But here you're a woman writer. So <laughs> you're not only writing about somebody way back then, completely removed from you, that canister and, and the horse are things you could kind of think about, but you never stood in the floor of the Roman Senate and watched their machinations. Mm -hmm. But you're also a woman writer. And so Tanya, as a woman writer herself, she asked how you wrote so convincingly, not only from a male point of view, but a man's point of view from almost 2000 years ago. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to say, to be honest. Um, I, I do have a theater background. I used to do community theater a lot. And whenever I had a role, I would always ask myself a lot of questions, such as I'd say, hey, um, what would this character think about this circumstance? Uh, how would they act? Um, if they were irritated, what kind of face would they make? What, what type of voice would they use on this particular line? Those are the types of questions I had to ask myself a lot concerning dialogue, concerning um, Antony's moods and what he would be like, what were some of his mannerisms, um, I stole one from my husband. <laughs> my husband chews his lip when he's nervous. And I, <laughs> and, and, and I just thought that would be something good for Anthony to do. So throughout his life, you know, when he's nervous, you know, he just chews his lip a little bit. Um, it's those types of things that, you know, are going to make and break a character. And you want them to be so real that you could reach out to touch them. You know, when I was in Italy, I'd see all these amazing busts, these beautiful marble busts. Um, back in Roman times, 2000 years ago, they were all vividly painted so that they would really resemble the person's you know, skin tone, what they wore, um, the color of their hair, their eyes, everything. And of course, all of that paint has chipped off. Sometimes they're lucky and they actually find traces of paint. But with, with Antony, I, I just wanted to take a chisel and just 
chisel through some of the hard, you know, marble and find the flesh there. I wanted to find out who he was, what he thought, how did he act? How did he react to certain things? What was it like when he fell in love? What was it like when he was killing a man? You know, all of these factors create character. And as an author, you know, you have to really be sensitive to the minute details. You have to be really, really alert to things that might come up in the history that you're dealing with so that you can put on the brakes and say, hey, whoa, whoa, what would he have done here? What does the historical record say that he did here? And then why did he do it? What forces were around, you know, causing him to react in this way or to take action in this way? So, ah, oh, wow. I hope that answers Tanya's question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she put you on the spot there, so I'm glad. Even though I did share with you the question was coming beforehand, it is really heavy to ask because a lot of writing is just magical. And to me, that's why I love books. I love speaking to authors because it is something magic when you can take those words and put them together just as it was for those sculptors who made those busts oftentimes. And mm -hmm. we go back and we say, I could never do that. And that's what the description of art is. If I can't do it, then wow, I could never do that in a million years, paint the Mona Lisa or make some great work of sculpture or carved wood. I do a little bit. I did these shelves that are behind me on the router. That's about this, as far as I'm really- well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I needed somewhere to put the books, right? <laughs> but uh, you mentioned dialogue there. And when I interview somebody from say 50 years ago or a hundred years ago, I always ask, how do you update that today? Here, mm. not only are you writing about a perspective from 2000 years ago, but you have to write about it in English when they weren't speaking English, of course, in ancient Rome. So how did you get that dialogue so people would have a flavor of how they spoke at the time, or maybe a flavius of how they spoke at the time, <laughs> so that they could enjoy the book and feel like they were transported. You didn't have people sounding like they were the Fonz from Happy Days or some other weird anachronistic speech. Yeah. You don't want to say, okay, and, uh, you know, uh, <sighs> That's it. It's dicey. You have to play around with it a little bit. It's certainly not going to be something that you um, magically just poof, you know, create in the first manuscript uh, for sure. But, you know, I, I like to use some Latin terms. Uh, for example, I use the word domus um, to reference house. I use the word gladius instead of sword most, most often. And that was because I wanted the reader to have a little bit of a flair for that, that Latin-esque world building. You know, another thing is, is I do tend to write modern. Um, I've been criticized for that um, in the past. In fact, just recently I had a reviewer just really nail me. You know, why are you not using Queen's English? It was obviously a British reviewer, but, you know, I'm American and and I want to be realistic to my audience, which is mostly going to be an American audience, even though I do have plenty of international readers. Um, and I, I certainly don't make it sound like the Fonz, but at the same time, I do use contractions. Um, I try not to overdo it. But I want people to be relating to my characters. And I think that if, if we make language so lofty that, you know, it's, it's almost King James version, you know, it's going to be ridiculous. People aren't going to take it seriously. Um, even 150, 200 years ago, uh, people like Thomas Jefferson, for good example, if you read the, their letters, they were extremely lofty in their language in comparison to, say, a letter written today. And I want my readers to be able to read and enjoy, not read and decipher. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I'm sitting here thinking about it and preparing my next question, which is about just that, because a lot of people do get turned off by the term historical fiction itself. They feel it's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And some readers who love the period, they can't get past something like a contraction or that they're speaking English. And for you, I thought that you're the perfect person to write this and to thread that needle so that we can sit back and enjoy it as readers and say, 
well, this woman knows her stuff about Rome. So <laughs> if I come along as little Dean Carianus that doesn't know much about the period and can't can't tell one centurion from another, and probably my biggest visions of Rome are from the Star Trek episode Bread and Circuses and things like that. And so I don't know exactly what's going on, but I trust you as an author to say, mm -hmm. You went into this clearly trying to satisfy not just scholars like yourself, but also people who are casual readers who just enjoy reading a great story. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be that you're reading it to learn that history that's just out of the book. And I think that's how you felt. So I won't lead you with the question, but you developed that muscle, I would think, over time where you knew you weren't insulting people or you weren't getting something so wrong that it made you cringe. So how did you work about developing that? You know, I, it, it's all, I think, in taste, in, in trying to determine my own branding as an author and how I want to convey things, whether they be historical facts, whether they be character, whether they be, whether they be world building. Um, for example, I treat my world building, Dean, as though it were a character because I'm historical fiction. So my world, you know, ancient Rome has to be so convincing that people can taste it. People can smell it. People can feel it. People can uh, see it, you know, visually and even in their imagination, hear it. And I think it's really important when people are tasting your work, that they just get it and they think, oh, this is the way it should be written. This is the way it needs to be conveyed. And you know, if I can do that through character, if I can do it through historical fact, if I can do it through you know, a combination of these different elements, you know, to me, I've succeeded as an author. Um, you know, I, I think of a lot of different reviews that I've gotten in the past. I think of a lot of different um, self-satisfying moments that I've had as an author in my short career as an author. And I can tell you there's nothing better than when I get an email from, from a reader that says, this book spoke volumes to me. It spoke volumes about the period. It spoke volumes to me about Antony and I understand him better now you know, sure, I might be a historical fiction author, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be historical fact in what I write. And I try my best to be as unwavering as I can about the historical record as, you know, it, it, you know, in not ruining that and, and bastardizing it, I should say. So. <laughs> well, you're being a tour guide is the way that I would look at it, where if you did take us back to Rome at the time, you wouldn't, stand around with us and say okay dean here look at this sandal you see how they did this sandal and they did it might be very interesting for a line but every single time you pass somebody with different shoes you're not going to stop and tell me about the shoes just as one example or the food okay i can see something boiling in a pot you don't have to stop me and say okay now this is not tomatoes because tomatoes hadn't been introduced yet. And that's exactly how historical fiction writing is because you can't show everything. These are beyond the days of fifth grade math, which I think you're a fellow person who doesn't do math well. Am I right? Oh, I suck at math. <laughs> so I'm married to an accountant too, of all things. <laughs> Yeah, thank God my wife is is really good with math too. So there we go. We made small yeah. moves. We could deal with the words and nobody ever <laughs> you a math problem. Especially you, you probably work in Roman numerals. So you could <laughs> you have an easy out. I'm just a dim. <laughs> so I, I tell exactly you what, I had to brush up on my Roman numerals to write these novels. <laughs> I'm not sure what the L is in the, in the oh, 50. Oh, the L's and the V's <laughs> and the X's. Yep. Speaking of going through and doing a tour, you have traveled extensively, which is another thing that Tanya Mitchell said to me when she was pitching you to me as a guest. She said, gosh, she goes all over. And that was the first thing you asked me was uh, if I was Greek. I don't know what gave me <laughs> away and it couldn't have been my last name. But you talked about how much you traveled on your website, actually, on brookallenauthor.com. 
And so Tanya said, please ask her about that. And I want to ask you because I often ask authors, hey, how much of so-and-so's world is left? How much of Ulysses S. Grant's stand at Vicksburg, his siege of Vicksburg is left? Here you're talking about something that's so much farther back in the past. And you went there and you walked these locations where Antonius lived and also where he fought. So how did those trips through the remnants of the ancient world flesh out the Antonius trilogy that people can enjoy today. Hugely. And, and, you know, in a lot of it, I did have to use my imagination, which ask my husband is vivid. <laughs> I went to Italy probably six times in the past decade in writing the book books, I should say. And, you know, there's, there's plenty to look at in the Roman forum, but the tricky thing is, is knowing what was there at the time that you're writing about. And there wasn't as much there as there is now. Uh, and things were situated a little bit differently. So, you know, while my husband was standing next to me looking around at the different temples and the plinths and the columns, I was staring at a hole that used to be the Cloaca Maxima, the sewer of Rome, wondering if somebody could smell it where I was. You know, I mean, those are the types of things. That's how I, how I think. You know, when I... At one point, I jogged from the Palatine Hill all the way to the Roman Curia, the, the old Senate house, just to see how long would it take, you know, and I did it in sandals. I had to do it in sandals. Oh, wow. Um, see, I went to, yeah. See, that's an important <laughs> detail of folks because that adds crazy. to the story. We didn't, exactly. Otherwise, we wouldn't care what you were wearing, but now it adds to it. We're all thinking you're crazy, but it adds to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a little crazy. I think you have to be a little bit crazy to be an author anyway. But uh, I did go to Egypt um, and I went in 08, which was right before the change in government, you know, when Mubarak was removed. And it was a phenomenal experience. Uh, and, you know, with each place that I did go, whether it be Egypt or Italy or Greece or Turkey, you know, I, I was able to even continue relationships with some of the guides that I used and some in particular were phenomenal. Um, my guide in both Rome and in Greece, especially, were, were amazing ladies. Um, when I went to Greece the first time, I had to see uh, where the Battle of Actium, the big naval battle at the end of uh, my last book, takes place and find out what that entire scenario looked like. Uh, it's a huge theater of war. You know, we think of the Second World War as having these huge, you know, mile after mile theaters of war, which were just enormous, you know, the area. And when I, when I was there, I was blown away. We're talking 50 square miles all around, you know, this huge bay, the Bay of Actium. Um, and, and to see it, you know, I was up on this big isthmus and looking around, it was just this huge area. And I thought to myself, how did they do it? How did they do it? They didn't have talkies. They, they, they didn't have cell yeah, phones okay. that, you know, it's like incredible smoke signals. What did they do? You know, um, it was amazing. Uh, Gordana Maruzzi, my guide there, she and I are very close. Um, I was able to visit with her just a couple of years ago, a second time when I went over there and it was a joy seeing her again. I've made some great relationships. Um, I, I, I was able to take them books, you know, when I completed Son of Rome. That was, that was a joy. Uh, so Sylvia satisfying. Prosperi. Yeah, Sylvia Prosperi is my guide in, in Rome. Uh, she owns the business uh, Friend in Rome. She's just phenomenal. She helped me access sites that were closed to the public. And I had to write and get, you know, permission from the, uh, the government of Italy to, to enter those sites. And it, it was just an incredible experience. At one point she went with me so that, cause she'd never even been to this particular house. It's the oldest Republican home on the Palatine Hill called the Casa dei Griffi, the house of the Griffins. And um, so it, 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 it's been such a journey in getting to know the period and getting to know the flavor of the period, the art, uh, even the music, cause I'm a musician as well. And it's been such a joy, you know, spending those, the decade and a half, uh, learning more about the Roman world and, and what Antony's place was in it specifically. So. So when hopefully readers, we've convinced them to pick up book one here, son of Rome, but when they get to 
the end of it. And I assume you leave us with a little bit of a cliffhanger there in his life. <laughs> and then at the end of second in command, again, we have a little bit of a cliffhanger. Eventually we know Cleopatra is going to show up and we'll get a much more real version of her than national velvet and the uh, old blue eyes there. She was Greek by the way. So I don't know how they cast Elizabeth Taylor. People complain a lot today about who's cast and what, but I never really got, got the Elizabeth Taylor vibe from her, but, but still. I agree with you. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you there. This is why I had you on. See, but, but tell us here in closing, once people get to the end of son of Rome, what do you hope to hear from them and what do you hope they will pick up the second book and then the third and enjoy so that by the time they get to the end, they really feel that they have met this man and gotten to know him the way that you have. Yeah. You know, Antony had his lovable, uh, I guess, uh, inclinations as well as the ones that made him a little bit edgy as well. And I, I just, you know, I, for me, he had a great sense of humor. He was able to laugh at himself, which not all Romans could do. You know, he was able to uh, sit down with a common soldier and just have discussions with them about anything and fit right in where most people of his birthright uh, in the nobilitas would never have done that. Um, you know, he made friends with actresses, with, with singers, with musicians who were considered kind of the scum of the earth in Roman society. <laughs> um, he, he sometimes freed his slaves. You know, he, he, was, he was the type of person that I think we would find it fun to go out with on a Saturday night. We might have to drive him home, but <laughs> <laughs> we could still enjoy going out with him on a Saturday night. I don't think he was stuffy. I think that he would have had a warm personality. Um, I, I think he's somebody that I, most readers are going to want to get to know and enjoy by the, by the end of all three books and kind of maybe have some tissues ready, especially if you get emotional for the third one, because, you know, we all know his story doesn't necessarily happen, you know, happily at the end, but at the same time, it's it's definitely a story worth telling, a life worth telling for sure. Well, Brooke Allen, I've enjoyed spending this time with you. And I know that readers, if they do pick up Son of Rome, they're going to enjoy spending time here with Mark Antony. And they're going to want to pick up books two and three, enjoy your entire trilogy and get to know this band. That's another thing that I bet you listed us, Grant. You just said it right there. We'd like to spend time with him. We would feel bad that he he has his ups and downs, but he just keeps trying. And it's a message that really is timeless, even though it's from way back in ancient Rome, as fresh today as when Mark Antony lived. And we can really learn from his example and just enjoy this story, the flavor of it, just a little taste we got from what you were kind enough to read for us. So I wish you the best of luck with this trilogy. Next time that I go over to Europe, I hope you are my tour guide. It sounds like you'll be showing me around Greece and telling me where the ancient things was. I hope that everybody will check out the book, check you out on your website at brookallenauthor.com. Get a flavor for these books. You can see they're beautiful. You can judge these books by their covers because the prose inside is just as beautiful and well done with attention to detail as the outside. So check them out. If you're listening or watching, you will not be disappointed. Thanks so much for having me, Dean. Again, the novel is Son of Rome, book one in the Antonius Trilogy followed by Book 2, Second in Command, and the rousing conclusion, Soldier of Fate. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the HistoryAuthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine turned chariot humming like usual. I have such admiration and appreciation for Brooke Allen. The fact that she took so much time to learn the hard history first brings her historical fiction to life in a way that few authors are able to pull off. Please visit her at brookallenauthor.com and you can find me on Tiffle. That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Plus our new YouTube channel. I hope if you're watching there today, you enjoyed our conversation, that you'll subscribe and you'll share these conversations with the people that you know who love history and would like to live way back when to see what it was like. 
That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you're watching or listening now. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review there. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with Brooke Allen and I today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.